Thank you very much, Sharon, um, and welcome to everybody to this session. Um, I will do my best to be a facilitator uh, as time goes on, but I'm going to be doing the first part of the session. Um, and if you can hope you can all see my screen, um, my colleagues Linda and Tandiwe will be doing will be following on after me. Um, and so my section is on research support, um, setting up your library account, using interlibrary loans, and accessing ebooks. So I think what I'll do is just go through mine. It's about 15 slides only, and then perhaps we can take questions. We'll have a look at the questions after that. And then when my colleagues are doing the, their session, then I will um, keep an eye on the comments or questions. Um, I hope that will work all right. Okay, so sorry, I don't. Okay, there we go. I've gone back. Okay, so for, um, the first thing I want to talk about is the research support available to postgraduates. So on the library website, you will find the heading research support at the top of the screen. And when you click on that, you will find a number of links on that page. Now, not everything that's available is on my screen. So I've kind of done two little double screens here, but you will find some information about research consultation and help um, and other information about postgraduate support, research management tools and so on. So as not to take up too much time today, I just like to recommend that everybody takes the time to have a look at these um, links and um, find out what is available for you. So yeah, I'm just going to go to the next one now. Okay, so before I go on, I just want to note that who is your, um, or who are your colleagues in the library that can help you with your research support. So our science and pharmacy principal librarian is Tandiwe Menze. She's going to be doing part of the presentation a little later. So her contact details are on here as are mine. And then there's also Linda Cartwright, who is the principal librarian for humanities and the librarian for the education faculty is Ayanda Komfo. So the next thing I want to have a look at is setting up your library account. Now it's really important um, that you do this. So if I'm speaking to um, students who have already been at Rhodes, you probably will have done this already. Um, you might just want to check your library account to see that it's current for this year. Um, for those who are new to Rhodes, you will need to set up your library account um, because very importantly, it, uh, your logins provide you with off-campus access to the databases. Um, and so that's essential because these days we are mostly off-campus um, and we could be anywhere in the country. So um, there is a, a, a tutorial that we've created. So please watch it. This um, is actually linked in. So you can click on the link and watch the tutorial in your own time. Um, it's also available on the library website under the tutorials link in the, in the menu bar at the top of the screen. But the other reasons why you need your library account is um, if you are on campus and the library is open, um, then you can, um, if you're taking books out, you can check the details of the books you currently have issued to you and see when they are due back in the library. You can also renew your loans from your screen, provided the books are not yet overdue or that they are not reserved by someone else. Um, you can set up your reading history um, and so as time goes by, you can always go to your reading history and see which books you have um, taken out in the past. You can also create lists of books, those that you might like to read at a later stage or want to dip into at some point. Uh, you can see your finds if you're interested in that. Um, you can also reserve books that are currently on loan to someone else. So you will, on the OPAC, which is library jargon, for the catalog or the library catalog screen, um, you can use the place a hold feature on that. And I think Linda might touch on that when she does her um, section on using search all. And then importantly, you can do interlibrary loans as postgraduates. Um, so um, this means that you can request 
books or articles that are not available through our library website or databases uh, filling in a form and I will talk to that um, in a few minutes. So um, if you, you, this is just a Sorry, there you go, you're back. Funny there. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you now. Oh, okay, there's a bit of a crackle on my side. I'm not sure if it's me or continue. It sort of just kind of keeps going a little bit soft and then coming back again. Oh, I'm sorry. I hope any people haven't missed anything. No, 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 no. It was just um, the last minute. Otherwise, okay. we'd be here. Okay. Thanks, Sharon. Um, all right. Setting up your library account, you can do that from the library webpage. Um, there's an I want to list on the right hand side, and you will see the link to log on to my library account. Um, so, to set it up, this is the screen you will see. You need to put in your surname in the first box. Um, in the next box, which says barcode, you need to put in your student number prefixed by six. So, for example, if it's uh, if it's this year's registration, you will put six twenty one, um, and then whatever your student number is um, in the second box. Now, when you're creating a pin, you leave the third box empty. You will just click submit. And a message will be sent to the email address we have on record. Please follow the instructions in that message to set up your PIN. If you don't receive an email, please contact one of us for assistance. Okay, now going on to interlibrary loans. On the library web, the menu screen, of course, and under services. In the list there, you will see interlibrary loans. So as I said, this, this is a way of requesting material from other institutions in the country. So you will use the online form. So once you've clicked on interlibrary loans, you will see the options coming up there. So if you click on online, um, you will see the options to select um, whether it's a book you want or journal article or chapter and so on. Um, you can see the options there. I just want to note that um, at the moment, I'm not quite sure where the books are circulating in the country from other libraries due to COVID. Um, so you, you can contact the Interlibrary Loans Librarian um, to confirm whether that's possible. Otherwise, um, articles usually are scanned from the supplying library and then emailed um, using the email address that we have on record for you. Well, in fact, that goes into your um, into the the screen that you fill in. Okay, so having selected book or journal article, um, you will see the library account login screen coming up. This is to authenticate you as a Rhodes user. Um, and once that has been completed, then um, you will find a, a screen coming up where you will need to put in the details of the item that you're wanting. So um, I think that will be self-evident. If it's a journal article, you need to put in the, the author title and the journal and so on. Um, and once you submit to that, that information goes to the interlibrary loans librarian who will source the item from another institution in the country for you. Um, and then once it's available, you will be emailed. Um, if books are available, then these will get posted um, to the Rose Library and you will pick them up. But as I say, I'm not sure whether that's functioning at the moment, but the article requests certainly are. Or anything that can be scanned and emailed um, will be available. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about are the, um, the eBooks that are available through the library website. Now, I think often, um, we uh, all think about ebooks. You know, we can purchase our own ebooks. Um, you can download ebooks as a personal user. But when it comes to accessing ebooks through the library, we the library has to purchase a user license. So um, the books then become available on the library catalog. 
So books are searchable on the library search all screen and Linda will, I think, do that a little later. And then the ebook record will be visible um, in, a list in, uh, in the list of records on the screen. Um, and I'm going to show you um, a few screenshots of how to go about this uh, shortly, but um, you can always refer back to these instructions if you need to. So when you see the ebook record, you will see an available online option. And when you click on that, you will, uh, the Rhodes patron link will come up either to EBSCO eBooks or Ro, um, Rhodes users link to ProQuest eBooks. So these are the main, the main um, suppliers of eBooks for the library. So on the EBSCO or ProQuest screen, please note the publisher permissions. Um, every book is possibly different. So it depends on what the publishers allow us um, to do in terms of downloading um, or printing and so on. Also, the books have concurrent user levels. This means that either we've purchased a one user license, which means only one person can use it at one time, or perhaps a three user license, or it could be a multiple user license. So please um, take note of that um, so that you know, you know um, how to pr proceed. And then for referencing, you will use the permalink or DOI link, which will be visible on the screen for each book. So um, while I'm, I have this screen headed EBSCO eBooks, some of this information also applies to the ProQuest eBooks. Um, it's just general information. So online use is often on a first come first serve basis um, and can only be used while you are currently in a session um, accessing the book. So you'll see you can print or email, save or download chapters of the eBook title for later use and, and as soon as the session is closed, the next user can access the book. Um, so just also bear in mind that if you have the ebook been inactive for 15 minutes, the session will time out and the book will be available to the next person. So people may be waiting or checking every so often to see if they can access it. And then um, I mentioned some books have a one user license. Mostly we purchase a three user license unless the cost is exorbitant. Um, but anyway, if it's in a one user license and the book is in use, um, the next student can um, place a hold on the ebook. And then also just to um, remind you again that the restrictions vary in terms of user licenses. Um, and then also there are restrictions and user access details can be found on the EBSCO host screen when you access a specific book title. And in fact, also on the ProQuest screen, which you will see shortly. So just to go through the process for searching for an ebook, you would use the search all, which Linda will, as I said, Linda will be looking at shortly. So on the li uh, library screen, you'll type in your title. Um, this is one I had to do before for somebody. So. I'm using this as an example. So you put in your title, you click search, um, and you will note that, um, I hope you can see the mouse on my screen. It will normally go to search all, and then you would click through to select OPAC. Well, that's not always necessary, but if you have um, many results under search all, um, perhaps you don't have the exact title, it might be um, something similar to the title. So in order to get to the OPAC, which will narrow your number of results, um, you could click on the OPAC. So I just want to, you'll see there is the print book available. And the one that I have circled is the ebook. So as I said earlier, you would click on the available online link, or when you click on that, this pops up, and you would click on the Rhodes Patrons link to EBSCO eBooks. And then one of you, once you've done that, um, let me just go back one. Once you click on the Rhodes Patron link, you're going to get the next screen that will come up will be your library account screen, um, as you saw earlier. So you'd need to fill in your, your um, surname, barcode and PIN. So make sure you set this all up before you um, try and access any ebooks or anything else on the library. So that the screen will come up for you to authenticate yourself and then you will get in onto the, the book on the EBSCO screen. Sorry. Okay, so this is the record for EBSCO host. It displays the PDF option on the left side of the screen. 
Um, the table of contents is lowered down. I just couldn't fit it onto the screenshot without making everything absolutely minute. Um, so you would notice when you scroll down the screen, you'll see the um, table of contents. And you can then select items by chapter or sections. And then also you will um, notice there are publisher permissions over here where it can tell you how many pages you can print, email or save. In this case, it's only two. So it is um, it can be quite restricted. Then the concurrent user level. So we have six copies available, which means that six people can access it at one time and others will just have to wait their turn. Now under the tools option on the right hand side, um, there will, you will see where you can print or save. And then the permalink, as I um, explained before, when you click on permalink, um, a link will pop up on your screen and that's when you can copy and paste into your reference list. So this enables your supervisor or anybody else you might be communicating with um, as to the exact um, online link that you have used. Okay, this is an example for the ProQuest um, book. So you would again do a search on the library webpage, the search all. Uh, and this example, you can also see there is the, the print one, which is available in the law library, um, branch library on campus. And the online version is available here. So again, you'll see available online. And when you click on that, you will see that you would be linking through to ProQuest. Once you link through, then again, you will have the authentication screen with your My Library account coming up. And when you fill that in, then you would get into ProQuest with the actual book. Um, so remember, there may be unlimited access, uh, which is very nice for this book. You will see your institution has unlimited access. So any number of users can access it at any one time, um, but it's also always good to read and check the availability of each book that you access because sometimes they are not um, uh, unlimited access. Your link to read online is available. It tells you how many pages you may copy. You can download the book um, and the pages remaining for PDF print or chapter download and so on. Everything will be visible on your screen. And when you scroll down again, you will be able to see the description and the links to the various chapters. Then your reference um, information is on the right hand side. Um, and so you can use that for your referencing. There's also a note, <clears throat> you'll note here on the bottom on the left hand side of the screen, it says add to bookshelf. So what you can also do is create a bookshelf once you've logged in. Oh, I must also point out the sign in option on the top right hand side of the screen. So if you sign in and create your own account on ProQuest, you can also have a bookshelf there. So when you are searching for books under a topic, perhaps you can also um, then create a bookshelf for yourself. So it's really just highlighting books that you want to look at at some point. It doesn't mean that you're downloading or using them, it's just a list. So you can always go back to your bookshelf and pick up um, any info, any books that you um, want to have a look at. Um, ProQuest can also be accessed from the library website, um, from the quick links list. When you scroll down on the library website, you will see that. So you can go directly to ProQuest to search for books on a particular topic if you need to. So this is just a reminder um, who to contact for research assistance. So that's there for you um, to use when you need to. So um, I'm now going to stop sharing or perhaps I should just check the questions first, the chat, um, if I'm able to. Don't seem to be able to see that. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and see if I can get to the chat from there. Okay. I don't know if anybody wants to ask a question in the meantime. Mm. 
Is there a specific app needed to read downloaded books? No, you can do it on your screen or you um, or EBSCO might give you that information. Sorry, I didn't cover that. Just check your EBSCO screen when you get to the actual book, but mostly you can just download it from the screen that you... Um, OPEC, sorry. What does OPEC stand for? Oh gosh, I'm sorry, this is library jargon. It stands for Online Public Access Catalogs. So it's really just the catalog um, on your screen. Okay, yeah, then Sharon, thank you for answering that question. Okay, so if there are no more questions, then I'm happy to um, hand over to Linda to share her screen. Okay, thanks, Jill. Um, I see Sharon has had to leave, um, so it's it's you and me at the moment hosting this meeting. So I'm going to try okay. and share my screen. Okay, please indicate, please, you know, don't mute yet and just indicate to me that the library web page is showing. Um, I'm uh, yeah, not, not very sure of myself as being a facilitator, but are you happy to take questions afterwards? Yeah, yeah. Okay, is, my screen, is, is my screen showing? Yes, it is. Yeah, it is. Um, your voice, maybe like mine, was went a little soft. I can still hear you, but... Um, okay, I think yeah, I just need, need to lean forward a bit. Is that better? Yeah sound fine now. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Linda Cartwright. I'm the Principal Faculty Librarian for the Humanities. And today I'm going to do a live demonstration, um, just showing you some search tips and techniques across some of the databases and some of our resources, electronic resources, uh, just to show you the wealth of information that is available to you as postgraduate researchers. And as Jill said, um, she's given you our contact details. Our contact details are on our web page. Don't ever struggle with anything. We are here to help you. So please just drop us an email, phone us, whatever you need, and we can help you with that. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start just with a very basic search. Some of this might be familiar to you, but you might just pick up a few tips um, just doing a basic catalog search. And here um, you'll notice that my search terms are very much humanities based because those are the ones that I'm working with. But obviously you would use, you put in your own search terms for whatever is relevant for you. So what I'm going to do here is just put in a very um, broad search into our search or function. So economics and journalism, I'm going to search for that. I want to show you how to refine a search because this, for instance, has come up with a huge number of items, 21,000, over 21,000, which obviously is way too many to work with. So you want to start refining your search. And Jill has spoken about OPAC, the Online Public Access Catalog. So I'm going to, first of all, go to that. And you'll see immediately the number drops to 50. Now this is for actually actual physical material that's held on the shelves, also eBooks. And at this point, I just want to point out, we share our system with um, four libraries share the system, our library system. It's Rhodes University, Nelson Mandela University, Walter Sisulu and Fort Hare. So the Eastern Cape Universities are part of a consortium of libraries that share our system. So one of the first things you might want to do is say you only want what is accessible to Rhodes users. So you would click on RU Main Library and that's going to take you to the items that are available in our library. Of course, it, being postgraduates, if you see something that is of great in interest to you and is available in one of the other libraries, but not in ours, you may use the interlibrary loan facility, which Jill, Jill spoke about. So don't forget about that, but I thought just for now, I'm going to show you how to refine. So there it's taken it right down to 18 items. 
And here you would, I'm, I'm going to have to move fairly quickly. So I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail with each thing to see the actual details of a book. You would click on the blue link and that will give you things like um, publisher, date of publication, et cetera. Here where it says available at, you'll see the first one is saying Fort Hare, but click on see all and it will take you down to what is available at Rhodes. So now you can see by clicking on that, and going further, you can see this particular book is available at RU Humanities and Education Books on level three of the library. And that is the number that appears on the spine of the book. It's called the Dewey number. It appears on the spine of the book and it leads you from the catalog to where the book is on the shelves. Okay, so that's just quickly explaining that. So now I'm going to go to the online tab, still the same search for economics and journalism. And by clicking on the online, you're going to see it's going to shoot up into the high numbers again. And again, you can refine the search. A good way to do that is always to say you want academic journals. So it's academic or scholarly articles. So it immediately takes away things like reports and miscellaneous items. You can also say you only want the ones that are available in English. That will take it down a bit further by going to, um, I'm not going to do it, but by going to the tags, which is are basically subjects, you can drill down a bit further. If you're only interested in mass media, for instance, you know, you would go to that, etc. There are various ways of refining down the left hand side. Now, obviously, when you come to these the ones that have a PDF link, if by clicking on that, you will be immediately taken into the PDF version. If it doesn't have a PDF link, don't give up on it. Always go and have a look and see, for instance, that first one, if you click on where it says road services, you'll see we do have access to it, but just through a different route. For instance, this one, we have access via Sage Premier. And here to get to the article, you would click on go and it will load it for you. I'm not going to do that because it will slow us down, but just to show you there are alternative ways of, of getting to um, what you want. Okay, so that is taking you, but, but, so the online tab is taking you to the online journal, journal articles. Okay, we've looked at the OPEC, which took us to the physical material on the shelves, the online journal articles. Now the fourth tab I'm going to look at is the Rhodes Digital Commons. And this is takes us to our institutional repository where all the masters and doctoral theses are um, digitized and available to you. So for instance, here now it's taken it down to four items. If you were wanting to look at this first one, you would go to digital file. Sorry, it's taking a bit of time. And there is this, um, it's a master's thesis, you can see here. And in order to look at it, you would scroll down, right down to the bottom where it says PDF, and you would go to download. And you would download, I'm not, as I say, I'm not going to do these downloads because it will take too long. And it will load the thesis for you to read. Um, as, as it appeared when it was submitted. So it's, it's a wonderful facility, the, the, um, the digital commons. Okay, so now I'm going to go back. Whoops, sorry, I'm just battling a bit to get to, to click on my, there we go. Okay, so I'm back to the search. So that is basically how you search using the tabs along the top, the four tabs along the top, and then the facets, as we call them, down the left-hand side to refine your search further. So that is just very basic searching on our search all facility. I'm going to go back to our homepage and just a quick tip, click on the badge, the Rhodes badge at the top left-hand corner, and that takes you back to the homepage. And now I just want to mention some of the databases and that you, you will find useful in your um, research. And one way of doing it is to go to the search tab here and go to databases, 
A to Z. This is helpful if you know the name of the database that you're looking for. For instance, you would go to the G for Google Scholar or the E for EBSCO host. But what I'm going to show you is how to get to the databases using the subject guides. Now we have subject guides at Rhodes for every subject that is taught. And I'm just going to use the journalism one because I've recently done a workshop for the journalism students. So here I would go to all guides and scroll down. You'll see as I'm scrolling, there are ones for every subject. And I'm going to go to journalism. Now, the reason I like to do it this way is because what we have done on these guides is we have selected the resources that we think are of particular use to students doing that subject. Because Rhodes subscribes to a huge number of these resources, it can be overwhelming to have them all listed. And some of them won't be particularly relevant to you and your research. So now each guide has a database and resources tab, as I'm pointing out here, and I'm going to click on that. And you'll see now it's listing the, the resources that we think are of, will be of use and interest to students doing this particular subject. Okay, so here, before I actually go onto the databases, I just want to mention a couple of wonderful resources. There's Press Reader, for instance. I'm just going to click on that quickly. And this is a resource that gives you access to thousands of newspapers and magazines from across the world. And And you have access to these at any stage. You can download the app onto your devices and access these for, for um, work or for leisure reading. You'll see there's a wide range of um, material available. So do explore that in your own time. I'm not going to go into any of that in detail, but just to make you aware that it is there for your, for your use. Okay. then. Here in this next box, it says ProQuest eBooks and Dissertations and Theses. Now, Jill spoke a lot about um, ProQuest eBook Central. I'm not going to go into that now because she has shown a lot of a lot of that. Um, but what I do want to make you aware of uh, is this ProQuest Dissertations and Theses. It gives you access to about nearly two and a half million theses from around the world. And this is a fairly new resource. And sorry, you just have to click on that again. And I do want, want you to be aware of it. And here I'm going to do a search. I'm going to do an advanced search on the platform. And I'm going to put in um, African literature as one of my topics. And then in the next line, I'm going to put um, oral tradition. And the reason I've used the inverted commas on either side is so that it searches for African literature as a phrase and oral tradition as a phrase. I don't want it just picking up theses where the words African and literature and oral and tradition come, if you see what I mean. It needs to search for those as specific phrases. And you'll see throughout um, the demonstration, I use these um, inverted commas a lot. And that's what they're for, is to denote a phrase. And you'll see it comes up with um, over 2000 results, for theses that come up with those particular terms in them. And this is a wonderful resource, really, uh, it's, it's an amazing resource. And you'll see here, you can um, click on the PDF link and read the, the full thesis. And you can refine further, you can say, for instance, that you only want doctoral dissertations. Um, not sure, I can't see my. It doesn't seem to have taken it down to any further. But anyway, there are ways of refining. You can um, say you only want in, within the last ten years. 
again, have a look down the left hand side for the facets that help you to refine your search. Okay, but just to make you aware of this amazing resource. Okay, I'm going back to our um, subject guide and then uh, just to quickly mention another wonderful resource, Canopy, which is access to um, over 30,000 independent and documentary films. So that is also available. Do go and have a look at that um, when you have a moment. But now I'm just going to get onto the databases. And here I'm going to show you just three. Um, there's so many and it will take, I don't want to take up too much of, of this um, time this afternoon because Tandiwe is still going to present her section. So I'm just going to concentrate on three um, of the databases, show you some searching techniques, and you can apply them to the other resources that you use. It's just to kind of make you aware of some facilities. The first one we're going to look at, which I'm sure is, is completely familiar to all of you, is Google Scholar. And here, as with all of these, I am going to do an advanced search. It's always better to choose the advanced search option because it gives you more flexibility in your search. And I'm going to look for articles that have the words representation, identity, and social change. Now you'll see I've used the exact phrase line and put social change in there. Now Google Scholar gives you that option to use an exact phrase. So here I don't need to put the inverted commas in because it's going to search for it as a phrase. But if it didn't give me that option, I would need to put um, inverted commas. And then it's going to search for articles that also have the words representation and identity. And I'm searching. And now here, what you look for with the Google Scholar search are the blue links down the right hand side, because those are the articles that we have access to because of our road subscriptions. Now, Jill was talking about how important it is to set up a library account. If you have had searched for this, the, the, if you had done this search and you were not on campus, but we're working off campus and you had not logged into your library account, these blue links would not come up down the right hand side because the system needs to recognize that you are a registered Rhodes student or staff member. And the way it does that is by you putting in your library account details. As soon as those are in, you are then recognized as a user and you have full access to our resources. So that is why it is so important to, um, to, to have your library account sorted out right from the start of your research. Okay, so that I'm not going to you know, go much further. I'm sure you're all very familiar with Google Scholar, but also while we're on Google Scholar, just to show you, and I will, with all these resources, it's a really nice facility to be able to create a search alert. Now here on the left-hand side where it says create alert, you would go to that, click on it, Here's your search string. You would put in your email address. I'm not going to do that because I don't want to be emailed with all these, um, these searches. And you can then set up this alert so that you will be emailed every time new uh, material comes in on your particular search topic. So it is a fantastic way, way of staying current with the, with your research. So you will be alerted every time there's new material coming in. Okay, so that's Google Scholar. Um, sorry, now I need to get back to my screen. And the next one I'm going to show you is EBSCOhost Research Databases. I'm not sure if all of you are familiar with this one. EBSCOhost is actually a platform that hosts a number of different databases. It is a, a great uh, multidisciplinary resource. And the, the idea with EBSCOhost is you select the, the databases that you want it to search across. So for instance, I'm going to do a search 
um, for post-colonial theatre. And um, for this one, I'm just going to stick with Academic Search Premier, which it defaults to, and it is a wonderful resource. But if you were, for instance, doing something to do with psychology, you would select, for instance, APA psych articles, psych info, etc. Journalism, you would select communication and mass media complete. Um, and as I said, just and the you know the the science ones as well. You would scroll through, select what you think would be relevant for your research. But for this demonstration, I'm just going to select Academic Search Premier, and I'll say continue. And here again, I'm going to select the advanced search. And I'm going to do what's going to look like a, a quite a um, kind of not complicated but slightly fussy search but it's really just so I can demonstrate to you how you can narrow your search you'll notice here I'm changing everything on the side to say all text that's because I don't want it searching for post-colonial um, only in the title field and not necessarily picking it up from the body of the um, of the text and then I'm going to put an alternative spelling okay so there you can see it. it's I'm saying find post-colonial spelt with a hyphen or with what as one word and here I change it to all text and theatre spelt the British way and Again, saying all text, I want another search box. So I go to this plus sign and add one. But here I want to say all. And here I'm putting theater spelled the American way. And the reason I've done this is that, so that it doesn't miss out on an article simply because the, the spelling is different. OK, so I'm wanting it to search for articles on post-colonial theater, but bringing in the different um, spelling options. Okay, and here I'm going to say I only want scholarly or peer-reviewed journals, so I'm going to tick that box and I'm going to say search. And it's come up with 182,000 items. Now here you can you can limit it by date. So here I'm going to say I only want say from I'm moving this along and saying I only want from maybe the last 20 years. Okay, let's say from 2000 and it's updating the search. This is really just to show you that there are all sorts of ways to manipulate your searches and to refine and to work with them until you're getting you kind of drilling down to what is really right for you. Okay, so let's just see it didn't reduce it by a huge amount. And obviously, you can then go down here and refine it further by subject by um, various this terms, you know, you could say it's specifically performing arts um, and so on, various ways to refine it. And here again, obviously, where there is a PDF link, you just click on that, you get the full article. But let's again just go say this, this first one is the one you really want doesn't have a PDF link, but let's just check under the SFX button or road services. And it takes you to a different route, this time via the Taylor and Francis Social Science and Humanities. And here you would go to go. Sometimes with SFX, it's not doing it here, but it's a really nice facility. It gives you recommendations of other readings with, with clickable links, and you can just go to those as well. So do bear that in mind. It's just a way of leading you to more resources. Um, so going back to my search results here as well with um, EBSCOhost, there's a way to create an alert. And I'm going to click on that.
And here you would set up an alert the same way with Google Scholar, each of them looks slightly different. Here you can select you want it once a week or once a month, etc. And you would put in your email address and you will then be emailed whenever uh, new material on your particular search topic comes in. Very nice facility. At this point, I just want to um, mention that with, with EBSCOhost, with, um, with JSTOR and all of these um, databases, it's a really good idea to create an account for yourself on, on the database. Um, and to do that, you go to where it says sign in or create an account. I'm not going to do it now because it takes too long. Um, all of it absolutely free. You create an account and you can then, um, you know, save your searches. You can create lists. You can create these alerts. For instance, a Scopus, which I'm going to show you now, won't let you create an alert until you have created an, an account for yourself. It's just a way of personalizing it for your own use. And um, I would suggest once you've decided, you know, which of the databases you're likely to use, then do that and um, create an account for yourself. You can also do it with a, a ProQuest, the, the one that Jill showed you for the eBooks. There too, you create an account, you can keep books on your bookshelf, etc., and go and, you know, read later ones that you've identified that you might want to read and so on. So it's, it's just um, is a nice way of, of using the resources. Okay, and then the final um, database that I want to show you is Scopus, and I've, I've actually just kept it there and put in the search already, just to save a bit of time. And Scopus is uh, one, another great multidisciplinary database, but do in your own time, just explore the databases that are on your specific um, subject, um, subject guide and you'll get to know which ones will be the most use to you. Okay, so on, on Scopus, I'm doing a search for Africa and digital technology or technologies. And you'll see here, I've used an asterisk behind the G. And this means it's called a, a truncation. So I've truncated that word. And what it will do is it will search for articles that have Africa and digital technology or technologies or technological, if you see what I mean. So it's extending your search, it's not limiting your search. Okay, so I'm going to search here. And you'll see it's come up with 266 document results and you would go down, see what you want to read, click on it, etc. And here too, you can refine your search by year, by subject, etc. Um, you can say you only want articles that would take it down to 172 items, etc. So always down the left hand side, there are facets to refine. And here I am actually signed into my account and I want to set an alert for this particular search string. So you just go here with um, says set alert and you can see each database is set out a little differently but the principles are the same for the searching for setting the alerts etc oh, it's not actually oh here we go sorry um, and here it's here is my um, search string and I would then set up uh, the battery in my mouse has just kind of died on me. That's not very nice. Um, and I've, I can set it up for every week, etc. Okay, I'm just going to go back. Sorry, I'm now using my. Go back to the starter base page and. Oh, sorry, I'm battling with my laptop. Okay, and here, over here on um, under A266, 
to G, you'll see there's a, a resource called Access World News. Just want to make you aware of that really wonderful resource linking to newspapers around the world. So do be aware of that. It's a product from um, Newsbank. And then these three resources are also Newsbank resources, African newspapers, wonderful historical newspapers from 1800 to 1925, um, with examining um, at your leisure, fantastic resource. Then the apartheid global perspectives, 1946 to 1996, another news bank resource and the Rand Daily Mail archives. So do just be aware of those. And as I say, please use your time to just explore and um, find out which ones you want to use. Don't just stick with one or two favorites. There will be overlap. Um, for instance, you'll find if you do a JSTOR search and a Google Scholar, you're going to come up with some of the same articles, but you will definitely pick up more, the more the, the wider variety of resources that you use. Okay, so that is pretty much what I wanted to cover and um, I'm going to hand over to Tandiwe now. Um, um, Linda, may I interrupt? I see that there are um, two questions before we go to Tandiwe. Um, oh, I found um, from Ashley. Um, she says, I found that it logs me out of Rhodes Library if I'm signed into JSTOR, et cetera. Is there a way around this? Um, and then there's one more question, but perhaps, I don't know. I haven't experienced this, have you? I can't hear you. Oh, sorry, I've just said I've never had that. I'm sorry. I'm just going to stop sharing so that I can get back onto the screen and see um, questions. Um, locks me out of Rose Library. I think that would maybe be a question for Brenda. Uh, Jill? Uh, yes, I think so. Um, we can, we, yeah, Brenda is our electronic resources librarian. So um, I either think, you or I um, can send that to her tomorrow. And ask yeah, but I think maybe what, what Ashley should do is email one of us and possibly with, um, with a screenshot and then Brenda could have a look at it. I think that's a good idea. Then at least we have um, Ashley's email and can get back to her. Then the, oh, you can see the other question. Yeah. Yes, thanks. Yeah, so uh, before you go, could I please ask about sorting results? Yes, um, most of the, these resources do give you the option for um, sorting them. I think uh, most of them automatically sort by relevance. So they go by the one where your search terms come up the most, but obviously you can change that and do um, do it by by date, oldest or oldest or newest, um, uh, sorting by citations. Um, I'm not sure. Um, Jill, would you know how to sort uh, by? Well, I think that, oh, sorry, am I missing the sorting by citations? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think that might, maybe Louise is referring to um, uh, which has the most citations and so on, or the H index and so on. I think maybe Louisa would be best to email one of us. I'm not sure which faculty or department you're with, so would perhaps select your relevant librarian from Linda, myself, or Tandiwe, and email us, and then we can take that further. That's great. Yeah, I think that's something that uh, we can't explain quickly now. Okay, if there are no Further questions for me, I'm going to just mute myself so that Tandiwe can, can do her section. Okay, thanks everyone. And as I said earlier, please don't 
uh, struggle with anything, just contact us for help. And good luck to all of you. Cheers. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tandi Wemenze. I'm the principal faculty librarian for science and pharmacy. For this afternoon, I'm going to be introducing you to RefWorks, which is a referencing tool that Rhodes University subscribes to. Okay. Now, I'm going to begin off by showing you where to locate RefWorks on our Rhodes University webpage. Okay, so you will see on the landing page of the library web screen, if you scroll to the bottom under quick links, you will see the RU, the RefWorks new version link. You will click on that link. Okay, and for you to start working on RefWorks, you will need to have created an account on RefWorks. So I'm going to be showing you through screenshots how one creates an account on RefWorks. Okay, for starters, you will have to click on the Create Account tab. Okay, so it's very important that you use your RU email address, whether you're a student or a staff member. And the reason for that is because you want to be recognized as a bona fide Rhodes University staff member or student. Okay, so this is just an example of how you would proceed. You would type in your RU email account you would click sign in or sign up. You would then create a password. Then the next screen would be sign up. Once you've created the account, it will either take you automatically to your email account or you will have to sign in to activate your account. Once you've created a RefWorks account, it's important that you install two plugins that are going to assist you with your workflow. The first plugin will be a save to RefWorks, which will appear on your browser. And the second one will be the write and cite plugin, which will appear on your Word document. Okay. So once you've logged in into your account, you will see under your name, you will click the arrow next to your name. It will then take you to tools. You will click on the link or the button tools. And the first option would be to install the Save to RefWorks plugin. You will then click hold on the black box, drag it up to your browser, and you would just drop it there. Once you've installed the Save to RefWorks button, you will then move on to download and write and cite for your Word document. Okay, so these are just the steps that you would use. Okay, so once you've done that, I'm going to show you, I'm not going to be doing actual searches on the databases, but I'm going to show you through screenshots how you would then export references from the various databases. Now, my colleagues have touched on some of these databases. We're first going to begin by exporting from search all. So once you've undertaken a search, on search all, you will then, if you're interested in some of the references, you will then select the reference that you want to move to RefWorks. Now you will see that I've highlighted the icon that you're going to use. So it will be the third icon. If you hover your mouse on that icon, it will then reveal export to RefWorks. You click on that export to RefWorks icon or button. It will then prompt you to sign into your RefWorks account if you haven't already done so. You will use the same login details that you use to create your account. That would be your Rhodes University staff email address or student email address, as well as the password that you created. Then you would sign into your account. You will then be prompted to click on the yes export to the newest version of RefWorks. Now, if you're going to be doing many searches of RefWorks, you would click on that. So at the very bottom, you would click on that button. Don't ask me this again. And when you do 
follow up searches, it will just send the searches straight to RefWorks without prompting you to export to RefWorks. Okay. So once you get into your RefWorks account, you will be prompted to select a folder. You have the option of selecting a folder if you have already created folders in your account, or you can simply export. Once you've exported, you will see that when I did my export, I did not select a folder. So my reference will lie in the last imported folder. Then I will just import and it tells me that a reference has been moved to RefWorks. And I will then click on that folder, but I'm going to show you that later on. The next, I want to show you how to export to RefWorks from Google Scholar. So you will want to either sign in before you do your searches, or you can sign in when you're in the middle of exporting. It's really a personal preference. Okay. As my colleagues indicated earlier, you will want to go through the library webpage when searching through Google Scholar so that you have access to all the articles that Rhodes University subscribes to and those would lie on the right-hand side of the screen. Okay. The first thing that you want to do before you do your searches in RefWorks is to enable RefWorks, to enable Google Scholar to export citations to RefWorks. You will notice that if you look at your reference at the very bottom, there should be a import into RefWorks, but it's not there right now. So what we're going to do is we're going to set it up on our Google Scholar account. Now, if you are using your own personal laptop, you only need to do this once. But if you're in the habit of using machines in the public labs, either in the library or the Jack labs or anywhere else on campus, you will need to set this up before doing a search on Google Scholar every time. Okay, so you go to the menu icon, you click on that menu icon. It enables the menu, you click under settings. Okay, and this should appear and under bibliography manager, you will enable show links to import citations. It will then list the various reference tools that you can use you want to select RefWorks because that's what we'll be working with. Once you've selected RefWorks, then you click on save. Okay, you see that now if I go back to my list, that import into RefWorks now appears. Now I can click on that import into RefWorks and the item should move over to RefWorks. And again, the similar screen appears do you want to export? You click on that button. Yes, export newest to the newest version of RefWorks. Okay. Now we're going to move on to PubMed, exporting references from PubMed to RefWorks. Okay. Again, you will want to, before you start your searches, make sure that you've either signed into RefWorks. Okay. The reason that I'm identifying these databases is because the exporting into RefWorks is not seamless. So you will, I want to highlight certain things that will not be known by many people. Now, when exporting to RefWorks from PubMed, it is advisable that you search within RefWorks because it does get complicated if you actually go to the database to do the searching and then from the database move items to RefWorks. So you will want to log into your RefWorks account and under search databases, you click on search databases and it should enable PubMed. For Rhodes University, it only enables PubMed. And then you want to type in the terms that you want to search. So we are searching PubMed within RefWorks. Once you've carried out your search, you will have a list of results that will come up. You then want to select 
the results that you prefer and you do the selection by ticking inside the box. Once you've selected the results that you want, you then click on that import button. Okay, you will see at the very top, it will show that green button. So it says that you have successfully moved or imported two references. These two references will lie under your last imported folder. You would then need to click on that last imported folder so that you can view the references. Okay. The next database that I want to show you, SciFinder N. So we're going to be exporting references from SciFinder N to RefWorks. Now, many people in the sciences know that before you can start using SciFinder N, you need to have created an account on SciFinder N. It does take 24 to 48 hours to create the account. That's something that you will need to have done prior. Okay, so you will need to log into your SciFinder account. You will then need to carry out a search by typing in, typing in your search terms. You will then select the desired resource that you want to import into RefWorks. Okay, so you will see that this is very different from the other references. Once you've selected the reference that you want, you will see on my screen, I'm going to click on that save to RefWorks under my favorites tab. So this appears on your browser. Remember at the beginning, I said that it's very important that you install two plugins. So this save to RefWorks plugin will enable you to save references if the database is not compatible with RefWorks. Okay, so you click on save to RefWorks. On the right-hand corner of the screen, it has that loading icon. Um, it does take a bit of time for it to load and for you to move references to RefWorks. Now, I was a bit hasty and didn't wait for it. Sometimes I'll have to wait like 30 minutes. So um, it's not going to show us exactly what the screen looks like, but I'm just going to tell you, once the screen appears, it will show the title, the author's name, and it will give you the option to either edit or ch make changes to the information or to add additional information. Once you've made additions, you then have the option to click on the button import into RefWorks. Now that does not appear on this particular screenshot. Okay. The next database that I want to point out, this will be exporting from Scopus into RefWorks. This is fairly easy. Okay. So you will have done searches on your database. Just need to make a bit of correction. It's actually Web of Science and not Scopus. So I would have carried out a search on my Web of Science database. I will then select the results that I want to send to RefWorks. Once I've selected by ticking inside the box, I will then click on the export button. It then enables the options that I can select. So I want to select RefWorks. You click on the RefWorks button, and then it gives you the option of deciding how you wish your references to appear. You can have the author title source or abstract, or you can limit the option. Once you've decided, you then click on export, and you will see that it's now exporting into RefWorks. Okay. The next particular thing that I want to show you is once you have exported your references to RefWorks, I want to show you how you can format and start sharing folders on your RefWorks account. Okay. okay, so we're going to start by sharing folders. Once you're in your RefWorks account, you click on the sharing drop-down arrow. So you have the option of sharing at an institutional level or sharing amongst individuals. 
So you can select a folder that you want to share at an institutional level. That means that you make it available for anyone within Rhodes University to view, to view the folder. So these are examples of folders that have been shared at an institutional level. This means that anyone within Rhodes can view these folders. Now I'm going to show you how to share at an individual level. That means you might want to share amongst people within your research group. Okay. So the next thing that you want to do is you click on your share folder button. You select the folder that you want to share. These are the folders that I have created on my account. Once you've selected the folder, you then type in the email address of the person that you wish to share the folder with. You can share it with one person or you can share it with multiple persons. And then you select the preferences. The person can modify, that means they can edit or the person can just view the folder. So the owner of the folder has the option of deciding uh, what the person has the rights to do. Okay. Once you've done the selection, you click on done. And then the person receives an email telling them that uh, someone has asked them to collaborate on a particular folder on RefWorks. They would then need to log in and view the folder. Okay. The next thing that I want to show you is how to manage output styles on your RefWorks account. Okay. So this is from the Word document. Once you've signed in, it's going to show you the output styles that you generally or normally use. So to manage your output styles, you will need to sign in into your RefWorks account. You will need to click on the citation style edit editor button. You will then click on new style. You can do a search for a style from the library on RefWorks that you want to add to your account. Once you've viewed the style, you have the option of editing the style. Okay, so you can start by typing. So if I'm looking for the American Association styles, you then type in the style and you will see you get a list of options that you can select. So you select the desired style that you want to use. Uh, you can give the style a name. You see that I have changed the style. So this is the name that's going to appear on my personal account. Then I create the style. Okay. And then I click on save. You will see right on top, it says that this is my style, which means that it only appears for your account, but doesn't appear for anyone else who uses RefWorks. Okay. And the style will also appear on the Word document when you sign in under right hand side. Okay. The next thing that I want to show you is how to format a bibliography. Okay. So we're going to go to a Word document. So let's say, hypothetically speaking, you've been working on your Word document. You want to then put in what is called in text citation. So as you're busy, typing, you want to go into your RefWorks account and then put in citations. So you need to sign in. Now, once you've created the right-hand site plugin, it will appear on your Word document under RefWorks. You will need to sign in. When you click on RefWorks, it has the sign in sign in box, you then put in the same details that you use to create your account. That would be your RU email account, as well as the password, and then you proceed to sign in. When you sign in, it will always sync the data. So let's say just before signing into your RefWorks account on your Word document, you were busy populating your RefWorks account, doing searches on databases and importing references into your account. It's then syncing it so that it's all synced, your account as well as your plugin on the Word document. So you will see that you have signed in and this is what it looks like when it has been enabled. 
you see the output style M AMA. This is the style that you will have used in your previous searches when you were working. It always defaults to the last style that you used. Okay, so you have the option of changing the style. So let's say maybe you want to move on to Harvard, then you move to Harvard. You click on the desired style. Once you've done that, you go to insert citation, which is on the left-hand side of the corner. You click on insert now. So you will need to have placed your cursor where you want to put your citation. It will then enable this box. So these are the folders that lie in your account. You then select the desired folder. You then select the references that you want to place in your document. You will see that my reference now appears at the end of the sentence. So if you want to add multiple references, you click on that plus button, or if you want to remove references, you click on that negative or minus button. So you would have added multiple references as in the last sentence in my example. When you are done with your write up and your in text citation, you then want to insert a bibliography or you want to create a reference list. Okay, let me just go to the back. You then click on bibliography options, you click insert bibliography. And then this is your reference list. And this will appear on your document, your Word document. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I will then exit my sharing screen so that I can see if there were any questions. Okay. Okay, I see my colleagues have been busy responding to questions. Okay, I don't see any questions right now. If you have questions later on, please do send your questions through emails and either I or my colleagues will be able to respond. Okay, thank you very much. I will now hand over to Sharon. Thank you, Tandiwe, and thank you, Jill and Linda. I certainly learned a lot through, during this session, especially about eBooks that I didn't know. Um, I also just, I wanted to add one more tiny note, Tandiwe, on the end of, of what you were saying, um, that demonstration of RefWorks was really helpful. But I found um, when I used RefWorks in my own PhD and, and other, stu other studies, like my master's before that, that even though I was telling it I wanted Harvard and then I think the other project I used APA, it still made little tiny um, I mean, maybe maybe the software is much not, much fancier than it was 10 years ago, 15 years ago, but it still made tiny um, little mistakes with punctuation. So even if you use a citation manager, you still need to take the responsibility for um, copy editing and proofreading your reference list to make sure that it is accurate and it hasn't left out any information. Um, because even when you use Google Scholar, for example, sometimes it doesn't have all the information um, about the publisher or the page numbers or whatever that you might need for a reference list. It's just worth bearing that in mind. It's something I've learned over the years. Are there any further questions or comments that you'd like to ask the um, librarians while you have them here um, in our last few minutes before we close the session? You're welcome to unmute your microphone and ask your question live or type it in the chat. Oh, thanks, Vainan. So Vainan says you can edit the punctuation in the um, in the fields in RefWorks. That was probably my problem. I probably didn't do it properly in, in the citation manager itself. So it just spat out what I told it. It's useful always to remember, isn't it, that these are just machines. They can't think. <laughs> Vainan, did you want to add anything? 
Um, I just want to say that, that uh, and thank you, Tandiwe, for, for that on the RefWorks. Um, it's really useful. Um, I ended up creating my own separate styles based on like Harvard or whatever. And I think um, it's good also if departments look into it um, because you can create a very specific departmental um, interpretation of a specific style. Um, but there are a number of issues I have with references. Um, and the one is using, using tools like this. As soon as a, a field is left empty, it is, uh, the, like you said, it's a system. It will still sort of look for certain values. If the value is not inserted, then it will add punctuation at times because we tell it to do so in its algorithm. Um, wow. So that's where the problem comes in. But it's the, the, the way to get around is actually to ensure that you have, that you up, update your um, uh, uh, reference. So in RefWorks, you have the option to find a, a more detailed record of that item and you can click update um, and it will fill in more fields but it's it is always best to go back and look at it and make sure that it is 100 correct because of different interpretations different data sets have different levels of quality of metadata um, and for consistency sake it's, it's best to check it before you run your final bibliography that's really good advice. Yeah, I think it's always useful to remember that these systems are fantastic. These tools are fantastic, but they're just, and they can't do the thinking work for us. We still have to take the responsibility. Yeah. yeah. And just to if add I, to Venan, yes, just to add to Venan, the place where you do the editing is under managing output styles that I showed in my presentation. Right. So that's where you would do the tweaking with the commas and the full stops before you run the final document. That's very helpful advice. Thank you. Um, uh, apologies, I just want to add something. Yes, go ahead. I'm sorry, I don't want to take over, but I work a lot with citations nowadays. And um, the one thing that I, I would like to say, this, this actually links to something that Jill or Linda said. Um, please remember to always add the DOIs to all your references because it helps citation um, analysis afterwards is, and the DOI is actually uh, central to this whole um, data analysis going forward but you can also set up like I, I can't remember if it was Jill or Linda that, that showed you how to set up a, a search um, notification on Google Scholar what you can do if you an editor or when you've published an article you can then enter the, the DOI in the search field and it will alert you immediately if somebody has cited you um, or if somebody cited one of the articles in, um, a, uh, you know, in the journal that you might be the editor of. Um, so that's another way to use the search stream, which is really nice. And very useful when you do all start publishing to track your citations, um, which are very helpful down the line for applications for promotion and probation and job applications and all sorts of other things. Louisa asks, can one categorize citations? Uh, in what way, Louisa? Do you want to maybe just ask your question, unmute your mic and ask your question? Hi, no, I'm just thinking because I've never used RefWorks before, but if we were grouping citations on a specific subject or a, sp a specific sort of category or theme, if I can put it that way, yeah, a theme would actually probably be good. Can one do that so that this would be related to theme X? Yes, you in can. In terms do of our that, research. Though. Yes, you can do that. The simplest way would be to create a folder and group all your citations under folders. Okay, yes, thank you. Okay. And Vayanance also adds to that by saying you can add tags as well. So you can create a set of keywords and you can tag your, your resources with keywords and then you can search for keywords and those will, it'll, it'll find those. So that's Just quite helpful. To note also, that when you've created a folder, as Tandiwe suggests, you can create subfolders within a folder if that is useful to you. 
Yeah, or, or there's, or it's also, or also like around your headings and subheadings while you're writing, right? You can use those as guidelines for that kind of thing. So that also is also very helpful. Well, thank you very, very much for this very informative and very useful and very practical session. Um, I'm sure we've all learned a lot this afternoon. As per usual, this will be recorded, this is being recorded and it will be um, edited and uploaded into YouTube either tonight or tomorrow. Um, the, the link to our YouTube channel um, for the Center for Postgraduate Studies is in the chat. And if you do have a YouTube account, we'd strongly recommend that you um, subscribe to our channel because then when we do upload new videos, you will get an alert on YouTube. Um, if you have a Google account, it's very easy to um, sign up for YouTube or to use YouTube with your Google account. So if you haven't um, subscribed, please subscribe and look out for our upcoming workshops and enjoy the rest of your week and weekend coming up. Thank you all very much. Thank you for having us. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.